Well, uh, we're beginning a little series uh, over the course of July in the book of Acts. One of the things we would really love to do is dive into the passages of Acts that we may be less familiar with. I don't know if you've read Acts recently, but it is off the charts crazy, the stuff that happens. Like, if you can't read that and think, oh my days, what on earth are we doing? Uh, then, then you're not reading it properly. And so we're going to dive into a couple of passages over the course of July. We're not going to do the whole thing, but I'd encourage you to read the whole thing because we're looking at just moments where people encountered the, the power of the Holy Spirit and what that means for us, for us. So if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to be reading from chapter 8. Um, uh, on your, uh, it will be on the screens, but it will also, uh, if you have it on your phones as well, that'd be great. Um, But also just to say that next week we have the privilege of uh, having a guest speaker with us, uh, a guy uh, called Jules Makosi, who is the pastor of Chalk Farm Baptist. Uh, We are uh, uh, friends, been friends for many, many years. We pray together with a couple of other pastors from Kentish Town area. Uh, Once a month we gather at seven o'clock in the morning and we pray together. And I'm excited to have him with us next week. Uh, to, to be part of our series in the book of Acts. But that's next week. This week, grab your Bibles. We're looking at chapter uh, 8, beginning at verse 1. Beginning at verse 1. And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. I may not have asked you to put that up on the screen, Toby. Apologise. It's not on there, is there? We can... Um, okay, well... I'll read it and then you can join in at verse 9. Apologies, Toby. Uh, Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city." Now picking up at verse 9. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him before because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart for I see that you are full of bitterness and are captive to sin. And then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of God, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we recognise that these, those times that we read seem so long ago and in some ways so far from what we experience. My prayer today is that you would speak to us about what this might mean for us. Give us eyes to see what it really means to be people that operate in the power of your spirit. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. So the beginning of that chapter, it just said, and Saul was there, approving of their killing him, referring to Stephen. Saul, who later became Paul, who wrote the majority of our New Testament, is here witnessing the first martyr in the Christian faith, Stephen, who was stoned to death before a a, a crowd and, and Paul, or then known as Saul, uh, was witness and approving of his death. The pressure is amping up in the early church. We will be familiar with what happened in the book of uh, Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit is poured out upon the disciples and they begin to speak in other languages and we're told that many come to faith that day in the name of Jesus. But the trouble is, once you've got a little group that is anonymous and in some ways powerless, and that group multiplies to thousands upon thousands, then if you are in a position of power, as the Romans were and indeed the Jewish authorities were, then you've got a problem on your hands. So they start clamping down and the pressure is amping up. And we see at the beginning of this chapter that the church is scattered, we're told. Jerusalem and Samaria, in fact, to fulfil what Jesus told them they would do, says, you will receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so it was becoming true. They are in fear of their lives as they have been scattered. But what is it? What is it in essence that is causing them to be persecuted in the way they're being persecuted? Well, one word. Power. Power. We are in a culture, for one way or another, obsessed with power. But I guess we could say that's always been true. We like power as human beings. We like people who, uh, we like to have power. We like to exert our power. But we're also in a culture that likes to tear down power, rightly so in some places where it has been misused. But we love the superhero movies, the ones where there is somebody who comes from a maybe a difficult background, someone who has lots of uh, uh, challenges in his or her life, who rises to become this superhero and, and calls upon a power beyond themselves and hopefully use it for good. But power is not necessarily a word or concept that really we feel that comfortable with, if we're honest, particularly at the moment in our culture. I feel like culturally we're in, we're in a place where we have seen all around us over the last 10, 20 years a real distrust in anyone in a position of power. You might want to check it back to the 2008 financial crisis where there were many people with financial power who lost millions if not billions at the click of a few buttons. And regardless of your political opinion, leaving many of us who were not involved in those decisions to pay in some way. You might see it too in the mistrust of the power invested in the media with the phone hacking scandal that emerged not too long after the financial crisis. Or indeed our crisis in those in political power where around again the same time there was the expenses scandal, politicians trying to claim whatever they felt they could, again at the cost of the taxpayer. But again, as you see over and over again, you see this pattern of institutional power in our nation, in our culture, being fundamentally mistrusted. And not for, not for, uh, for fully understandable reasons. And of course, the church has not been exempt 
we have our own shame to carry of where we as a church have misused and abused power. But today I want to talk about power and not how we avoid it, but how we operate it in it well. You see, it's very clear from this passage and as you read through the book of Acts that the early church operated in power. But not the power of human construct, but the power of supernatural influence. You see, the church in many ways was powerless by human standards, but operated powerfully in any other way. We've just finished a series on the book of Ephesians, and in Ephesians, it is the laying down of our claim to power that Paul encourages the church in Ephesus and us to do as well, to lay down our claims to power, to lay down um, those things where we are able to have our own agency over other people. And in the middle of this book of Ephesians, he says, submit to one another as you submit to the Lord. Submit to one another. That actually for a Christian to follow in the way of Jesus is to relinquish the power that we have because of our gender, because of our race, because of the power that's been given to us in our employment. To whatever the power is that we have, we are to lay it down. See, Jesus, he, in the line of Jesus, Paul is urging us to do the same because Jesus, we're told in Philippians 2, laid down all that was rightfully his, set it aside so that he would be operating as a servant to us. He laid it down. Jesus laid down claims to power but was never powerless. And in today's passage, we meet Philip. Philip, who we don't hear much about either before or since, but he operated in great power. We first meet Philip, this Philip that we're talking about. It's very confusing. Most of the disciples have the same name. There's Matthews everywhere. There's Johns. You can't, you can't go through a page without meeting a John, apparently, but they're all different. Um, and uh, no one's got surnames. It's really complicated. Uh, but this Philip is different. Um, this Philip we meet in Acts chapter 6 because the disciples recognise that due to the number of people coming into the fellowship of believers, they need to start caring for one another. And so they appoint six people to look after the people that they need to look after. Sorry, seven people rather. To look after the poor in the Christian community in Jerusalem. And Philip was one of them. Philip's mandate, he was not a headline act. He was not someone that took the front stage. He wasn't someone that grabbed the microphone. Philip's role was to simply serve the poor in the community around them. His job was to care for people, pastor them, love them, meet their needs. And yet we are told this. Philip went down to a city in Samaria in verse 5 of this chapter, and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. They had been scattered because of the persecution they had facing. Most of them will have heard about or maybe even seen their friend Stephen uh, be martyred for the sake of the faith. And Philip was one of the people that had been scattered and sent out. And he operated in such power, we're told, that he set people free from demonic oppression and people were healed. This was a man that was not given any institutional power. He had no authority in and of himself, but he did operate in supernatural power. He was an ordinary person like you and me. Those of us who have said yes to Jesus can be filled with the kind of power that heals people and sets people free. And the mandate of Jesus when Jesus ascended to heaven was to say, I'm leaving this now for you to do. The things that you've seen me do, the things that we read about 2,000 years later in the Gospels is now up to us. 
It's not up to the professionals on the stage. It's not up to me or Lara or Lizzie or the clergy in this church. It's up to us. It's interesting to me, sometimes we get into these funny conversations as clergy. I'll let you into an insight. Sometimes people say, oh, I've not seen the church recently, or the church hasn't visited me recently. And we discover that actually what is meant is that the clergy haven't visited them recently, or the clergy haven't been around recently. But we discover that the church has been brilliant because friends have gathered around and prayed for and served and loved and cooked for and pr- done all the stuff. The church has been exactly what the church is about. I will never be able to meet the needs of our community. Lara's not going to be able to do it. Lizzie's not going to be able to do it. But as a church, we might begin to dip our toe into meeting the needs of our neighbourhood and our community. Because Jesus didn't say it was up to the professionals on the stage or those with a microphone. He said it was up to people like Philip. People that you, if, you, if you skip a page in the book of Acts, you never knew existed. But people like Philip radically changed the lives of people in Samaria in such a way that people were healed and set free from demonic oppression in such a way that their lives were never the same again. It was the church at work through the power of the Spirit, through ordinary people like Philip. And the power that is on display through Philip, it doesn't just end there because it starts to grab people's attention. You see, you can't go too far healing people who who have been lame all their life or indeed have been unable to walk all their life or have been oppressed by some kind of spirit. You can't go too far with those things changing before people start to take notice. And sure enough, they do. But the one person we're told about, the one person that came up on the screen earlier is the man called Simon. Now, Simon knows this area. He's been playing this game long enough. He can get out a pack of cards and he'll tell you which one you've chosen. He can do the ball under the cup trick and he'll be able to tell you where all the balls have gone and even though you thought they were in one cup, they were in another. He's the one that takes a, 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 someone out of the crowd and puts them on a stretcher and cuts them in two and then suddenly they're back together again. He was a David Copperfield, the, maybe this is a different generation. Think of another one, Dynamo. See one? Yeah, magician of his time. I like to th- remember Paul Daniels and his assistant, Debbie McGee. That was the magician you could, you know, watch home on a Sunday, you know. But he was the one around town who knew how to operate in the magic, the sorcery of things. He had a reputation. He wasn't just an entertainer. He had people who followed him because of the things that he did. We're told that he did such amazing things that people were in awe of him, that many people thought were in the supernatural world. He's known, we're told, across the whole of Samaria. He's well known by place people that we're told are high and low. People with influence and people with none. And they are all amazed by him, but not just amazed, but they assign him a title. They say, he is the great power of God. They didn't know what to do with the kind of magic work that he operated in. And although I kind of was slightly flippant with my use of kind of stereotypical magic tricks, I suspect that the kind of magic and sorcery that Simon was involved on was probably dabbling in something in the supernatural, just not in the good way. So he has a following. He probably has an income from the kind of things that he does. But now his reputation is at risk because Philip has shown up and is doing things far greater. Philip comes into town and when people see the power that he is operating in, and him preaching the good news of Jesus, they start to follow Philip. Philip is the new kid on the block. Philip is the guy now that they're thinking, Simon's yesterday's news. I'm interested in this man, Philip, because he seems like he's got the real deal. 
They start to follow him. They're baptised and become followers of Jesus. We see in verse 12, when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptised, both men and women. And so Simon sees this and begins to follow Philip. Philip, he recognised, even Simon recognised with all his supposed talent, recognised that Philip had something that he did not have. So much so that Simon wants to buy the tricks. He wants to come into the magic circle. He thinks that if he spends enough money, he can have what Simon has. He thinks if he can kind of get himself in with the crowd and follow uh, uh, Philip just as much as all the others are following, he'll be able to pick up some of the tricks too. He'll be able to see the sleight of hand that happens behind closed doors. But what he sees, he cannot fathom because it actually isn't trickery. It isn't a conjuring trick. It isn't a sleight of hand. It is the very power of God. And Simon wants to buy this ability. We're told in verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, we get this response in verse 20 from Peter. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. So attractive was the power in which Philip operated that Simon thought it was worth every penny he had to buy it. He knew that there was no substance to the conjuring tricks that he was offering. He knew that there was nothing of meaningful, life-changing moments than what Philip was in his humility offering instead. It was like there was no comparison. And all the way through the Gospels and all the way through the book of Acts, which as you remember is the second part of the book of Luke, essentially, written by the same author. All the way through the book of Acts, we see this dynamic at work. And I use that word deliberately because it's where we get the word dynamic from is the same word that we get the word power from. Is that everything happens in power. The very living power power of God. And if you go home today and read the book of Acts and look for the word power, you'll be stunned. And none of it is in their own power. None of it is in their own ability. It is all in the power of God. So what is it as we look at this series in the book of Acts, as what is it that we can learn from this encounter? Just the five very quick points on Holy Spirit power. The first is this. Holy Spirit power is very clearly supernatural. There were healings and people set free from demonic oppression. It's more than when we use the word power, I think casually, we often think it's just inner strength. You know, we pray, come Holy Spirit and give us power. And I think we make this unofficial translation often, that that means we are mustering up some kind of inner strength. But it is very clearly a supernatural power. The things that happen in the book of Acts happen through the supernatural power that God gives the apostles. People are healed like that. People are set free from oppression like that. People come to faith like that. There are crazy moments in the book of Acts where you cannot avoid the fact that there is definitely something supernatural going on. So the first thing is that the Holy Spirit power is very clearly supernatural power and not human power. Secondly, Holy Spirit power is through us to others. It's clear that as the disciples prayed, as Philip prayed, the power of the Holy Spirit was, came through Philip supernaturally and met with the people that they were praying for and with. We are conduits 
of the power of God when we pray for people. So I just will remind you again to see it through this lens. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That means that the, 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 the same power, the supernatural, the power of God is in us and is, he uses us and comes through us when we pray for other people. There's this moment when Jesus is in a crowd in Luke chapter 8. And there's, there's a woman who has had heavy bleeding for a long, long time. And she doesn't have the courage to come up to Jesus personally. But in this hustle bustle of a crowd where lots of people will be touching Jesus, brushing past Jesus, she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus in that moment stops and says this, someone touched me. Now, in some ways, that's a crazy thing to say because every, I mean, it's like going to, to, um, you know, a bustling marketplace. You know, people are brushing past each other all the time. Jesus, of course someone touched you. Everyone's touching each other here. We can't move without being touched by somebody else. But he says this, somebody touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And she was healed. We are conduits of the power of the living God to help others. He oft, it's like when we uh, charge uh, uh, something through a, a power bar with our phone or something and we, we plug it in, it has a drain on it. You know, when we plug it in, it charges our phone. It comes through that cable, as it were, and charges our phone, but it means the battery itself is depleted. There's been, we are a pass-through of the power of God in that sense. And often God uses the laying on of hands to do so. We're told again in this passage, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They place their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. There is a connection between what we do when we pray for other people and how God meets with them. Now, it's not always, but often God uses the the laying on of hands to do so. And then Simon says this, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, he offered them money. He himself could tell that when the laying on of hands happened, that God's power was like a conduit through the disciples to heal and meet with other people. Why does he do it? I believe he does it because he wants to partner with us in ministering to others. In the same way that when Jesus laid hands on people in in the Gospels, we see it there. So firstly, Holy Spirit power is very clearly supernatural. Secondly, Holy Spirit power is through us. Thirdly, Holy Spirit power is for the sake of others. Philip used the power he had to serve others, to set them free, to heal them. Simon, by contrast and by rebuke in the end, wanted to use it for his own reputation. It's not about us. We don't do the work. God uses us to do the work. He chooses by his grace to partner with us. Fourthly, Holy Spirit power gives weight to our witness. Isn't it interesting that at the very beginning of the account, the disciples have all been scattered across uh, Jerusalem and Samaria and and, uh, Philip is already operating in Samaria and it says this, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. When you start praying for someone to be healed and they're healed, my goodness, do they want to hear what the rest of you got to say. If you pray for someone for, 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 for them to be set free of an addiction or, 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 or an oppression of any kind, 
and they wake up the next day and their life is tangibly different, they want to know the Jesus that you've been talking about for 20 years. The signs point to Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives weight to our witness. And finally, we should expect to be filled with Holy Spirit power. Holy Spirit power is given to bind up, to fix up and to tool up. To bind up the work of the enemy in us. To bind up that work and, and, and to make sure that we're set free from that. To fix up, he's, he's there to heal us. And thirdly, to tool up, to equip us. There's an expectation throughout the book of Acts that we need an encounter with the, uh, the Holy Spirit. That, they are, that the believers are filled with supernatural power. You will receive power, Jesus says. And that's why in Ephesians, going back to Ephesians, Paul says, do not get drunk, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit. So we pray for one another because God uses us in partnership so that others can, have an, uh, to be, that others can be met with the power of God. So that when we come to praying for one another, and we're going to allow space to do that now and over the next few weeks, we should all come expectant. We should all say, yeah, I want some of that. I need to be equipped to be in my workplace more effectively tomorrow. I want some of that because I know that I need to be healed or set free from something. I want, so there's no shame in it because we're either being tooled up, fixed up or bound up. Those are the things that we need. So, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, that power done through the work of God is so liberating and is what he would have us do. So why don't we do that together? Why don't we come expectant over these next few weeks? And I encourage you that if you, if you leave over these next few weeks having not been prayed for, then you will have been missing out. Let's stand together and let's pray.